Hi everyone, I would like to welcome you to The Hot Seat, a wireless design and development interview series where we talk about the latest wireless technology, components, and design issues for the wireless design engineering community. Today we are speaking with Bill Conley, Systems Engineering Manager at b, &B Electronics. Bill has over 25 years of experience in the wireless field as an embedded design engineer, specializing in the digital microcontroller and microprocessor arenas. He won the Most Innovative Product Award at LAN Mobile Expo for one of the first wireless mobile MDTs, and he also won an award for the Best of Wireless Telemetry back in 2002 at Sensors Expo. He holds several patents in the industrial wireless field, and today he will be discussing sensor networks, in particular for a well-monitoring system out in the Sonoran Desert. Welcome to the hot seat, Bill. I know you have a presentation for us, so can you provide us with a brief overview, and then we can save questions for the end when you are finished with your presentation. Thank you, Megan. Um, uh, some of the difficulties that we've dealt with out in, the, in Arizona is uh, the ability to uh, maintain and store uh, water for municipalities and for uh, livestock. So uh, most of the well systems out in Arizona are, for the most part, mechanical, meaning that they have no uh, intelligent controls. So we know that the network, uh, the, the network of things uh, is expanding. Uh, the MDM industry has predicted billions of devices. Uh, most of those are uh, edge devices, which is what we're going to talk about. Uh, and sensors are, for the most part, being asked to uh, to perform functions uh, in increasingly harsh environments like the one out in Arizona. So some of the things that we dealt with uh, in, for this deployment was extreme temperatures. Uh, we can get up uh, to 120 plus degrees out in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, lots of dust, lots of wind. Uh, sometimes there's rain and um, not very often but we do see snow out here so temperatures uh, do tend to to get frigid. Um, Arizona also has one of the highest lightning uh, strikes or number of lightning strikes uh, in, in the uh, world to be honest with you. So we have to be able to protect uh, against that. And in this case it was uh, an issue of distance. Um, not only a distance between the sensors uh, that uh, from the information that we're collecting from the sensors but as well as the ability to um, internet enable or IP enable the devices and I'll show I'll show more about what that looks like. So this is this is the actual uh, site um, the lower right hand corner here you'll see the site and it contains a, a water well uh, it contains a pump in the ground and it contains storage and then pressure pump. Uh, this serves uh, uh, about uh, 12 uh, families um, and it is out in the middle of nowhere um, in particular uh, north of Tucson. So the, the, the system was basically designed where um, the cellular modem that we have attached to it is in one location and then the sensors as you can see is in another location. The reason why we did this um, is because we didn't want the cell site uh, power the, 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 there was an issue of solar panels that were uh, located on the left hand side and the um, the telemetry side or the sensor side was on the right hand side which is the well site. So uh, on the right hand side you'll see um, uh, the the site that I showed you before on the left hand side is where the cellular and solar panel to control everything is. So uh, again, uh, you know, some of the environmental issues that we dealt with. Um, I apologize, there's a delay. Um, we do see some very hot summers out here very high winds. We can hit some of the microbursts out here uh, in excess of 60 to 70 miles an hour. Uh, dust storms, uh, we don't see many blizzards out here but we do see some snow, uh, lightning strikes and uh, lots of rain on occasion, especially the monsoons, uh, monsoon seasons. Um, this particular well is controlled mechanically meaning there is no intelligent controls on here. There are mechanical mercury switches that control when the pump uh, in the ground gets turned on, uh, this is this is what fills the uh, main tank, 
and there's mechanical switches that uh, and pressure uh, uh, pressure switches that control when uh, the demand for water uh, becomes necessary. So failures are very unpredictable, uh, and a lot uh, lack of uh, water can obviously be life threatening. So in particular, this is the way the system works. The well is in 660 feet of ground. Um, the pump is actually in about uh, 20 feet of water, so the well is very, very deep. This is typical in Arizona. Uh, the the uh, out, particularly in Arizona, in Tucson, the the uh, wells are or the, the 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 holes that need to be dug for these things are extremely deep. So. We monitor the current from the ground pump. We monitor the uh, level of the holding tank. We monitor the current of the pressure pump. And we're monitoring the pressure uh, within the sensor tank. Or excuse me, within the uh, pressure tank. So the way this works is that when the holding tank uh, is drawn down, it turns on mechanically the ground pump which fills the holding tank back up. The holding tank uh, gets its demand from the pressure tank. Uh, the pressure tank comes on when uh, the demand for water exceeds what's in the pressure tank, meaning that everyone turns their faucets on. Um, so neglecting or overlooking maintenance on the pumps can be extremely expensive. It costs upwards of $10,000 just to pull the pump out and replace it, even if it's under warranty. Uh, we had one summer where we pulled the pump out three times because of uh, faulty capacitors, uh, because the pump was continuously turning on and off. And I'll explain why the pump was continuously turning on and off. Some of the data that we collected from this showed us why, uh, why this system was an, a perfect candidate for uh, a, a, an intelligent control system. The sawtooth uh, waveform that you see on here is the demand in pressure. So you can see it decline, and this is actual data. This was collected from the pump over a period of time, or from the system over a period of time. You can actually see the, the uh, fall of pressure. This is the demand from uh, the houses out here. Um, and as it fell below 30 pounds of pressure, then it turned on a uh, pump and that's what you, that blue line is uh, that you can see continuously cycle through. As the, as the pump drew water down from the, uh, from the holding tank, that black line indicates uh, the main pump from the ground being turned on to fill up the, the, the main tank. Now what's very difficult to see here is that we have static pressure sensors in the ground that measure the drawdown. And the drawdown is typically when the, the, the ground pump turns on, it, it, uh, it typically draws the water down from the ground by a certain percentage. And um, I apologize, but the, the graphics doesn't show that. Uh, that, is a, that is a very good indicator of your aquifer uh, being depleted of water. Uh, the danger there is obviously uh, if the water line falls below the pressure, the uh, ground pump, then you start uh, pulling in lots of air, and that's very bad for the pump. So these are all very good indicators of what uh, of of what the your system is doing. So this is the effects of a of a mechanical system. This is why intelligence is so necessary for a, a typical system like this. We found that the working area within within this holding tank was in this green area where it says working area. The system was not taking advantage of the entire spectrum of this tank, meaning that it wouldn't allow, the, the mechanical switch wouldn't allow for the water to fall below that 10 foot mark. And it caused the pump, the ground pump to cycle all the time. Uh, an intelligent system would allow not only the ability to um, take advantage of, uh, of of cheaper power, uh, meaning that you could turn, you could you could manage the system where it would uh, fill the tank up at night. Um, you could also manage it to where, um, uh, based on demand, you could fill up the, the tank where you wouldn't have to cycle so many times. 
So this picture shows, and you can see at the very bottom of the bottom corner there, that is the drawdown, that little uh, spike that looks almost like a, a heartbeat. That is the drawdown of the, of the pump that I was trying to show earlier. That's actually the pump coming on and drawing water down the pump settling and then uh, and allowing the, the water level to rise back up. That is a very good indicator of your aquifer. If it falls below the pump, again, you're going to cause damage. And this is a very good indicator of, 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 of what is necessary to, to maintain a, a well out in Arizona. If that were to happen, it means that you would have to completely pull the pump and then hire someone to, to, uh, to dig basically the deep the hole a lot deeper so you would end up uh, maintaining a, a water level for the pump to draw from. So this is the desired, I put some, I put some statistical information here so that I put two uh, elements in here which is a desired level and the desired ground pump and you can see basically instead of cycling the pump so many times which is the green line is to, uh, is to allow the holding tank to draw far uh, shallower and then pump for a lot longer saving on uh, running capacitors and and start capacitors which is caused causes the most damage when those pumps come on and off so this was a, per, uh, a perfect uh, statistical analysis of why intelligence is needed and why sensors are needed on some of these systems out in Arizona um, the the information that we're capturing from is that we do have an IP camera out there for security uh, because the well is um, uh, is located in a very remote location uh, security is a factor we can see real live real-time video from the location again we're monitoring the pressure tank we're monitoring uh, pressure pump current and the holding tank level so one of the things that we do is that we have the ability to capture Modbus. Uh, some some people are familiar with this thing, uh, uh, with the protocol. Some people aren't. Modbus is a protocol used in the industry to allow for remote telemetry and monitoring. It is a standards-based uh, protocol. So we have the ability not only to do the remote telemetry and the security in one system without having to add much more than an IP camera to the to to the system. So some of the options outside of cellular um, is fiber, uh, Wi-Fi for, for a remote uh, local network, proprietary RF, which is what we're using, 900 megahertz proprietary RF. Um, the, the options, some of the options here, to be honest with you, are not feasible because um, it takes, if it wasn't for cellular, if it wasn't for proprietary RF, in, in this particular uh, case, you would have to trench uh, wires for the for the sensors. So this is what the system basically looks like. Um, it's uh, sensors attached to our proprietary RF devices that collect data from uh, our Zlinx Extreme device, uh, which is a uh, native Modbus uh, remote I/O product. Uh, those uh, get the sensors get attached directly to those. The then the product through a uh, modem is attached to the cellular router, uh, and the IP camera is also attached to the cellular router. Uh, that is all pushed through the cellular network and then back to a central office. And this basically is what it looks like. Um, you've got a, our uh, RT3G uh, spec, uh, Spectre 3G routers that are attached to our, our Zlinx Extreme product, which is a Class 1 Div 2 um, outdoors IP67 rated uh, product. It's very robust, very reliable. Um, it's dust proof, waterproof, um, all those things, all those uh, those environmental uh, pieces that we talked earlier about, um, it maintains itself very well out in the Arizona desert uh, to include the heat. So we're monitoring a pressure sensor through uh, the the uh, uh, proprietary RF link, the pump through the proprietary RF, RF link, and then the level indicator through the proprietary RF link. Now, for demonstration purposes, I put three of them on here. You don't need one for every sensor. Um, these support uh, two sensor inputs 
as well as the ability to control if you chose to do that. Right now the system only monitors. We don't control anything from here. And the security camera uh, attached uh, into the cellular router so you get the, uh, the telemetry as well as the IP security camera piece. So one of the things that we did is that we added redundancy, uh, a solar pow uh, power redundancy. And the reason why we did is because although this, the solar panel does not uh, supply power to the pump, it does supply power to the, the uh, telemetry system that will let you know that your power failed. It gives you the ability to um, uh, get a text message or uh, some type of other message uh, that would indicate that the pump has failed and you need to get a technician out there as quick as possible to repair the problem. Um, so this is just um, some statistics on how much, uh, in, in particular in Arizona, uh, solar is very good because we get uh, we get some 360 plus days a year out here of, of sun. So um, our outdoors uh, rated RF equipment, I, I briefly touched on this, but I will go through it uh, a little bit more. You can see in this picture the um, uh, Z-Lynx Extreme product uh, being attached to the current sensors um, and then remotely uh, through um, RF being attached back to the cellular router to collect the data so you can monitor and if you chose to control this from anywhere in the world. So, as indicated before, this is our Z-Lynx Extreme. It has uh, some really, really neat features in here, like the ability to monitor the signal strength. So if you were deploying this, you would be able to, in real time, uh, uh, detect your signal strength so you know you're connected to the other side. It is Class 1 Div 2 for hazardous environments, so this application fits perfect for the gas and oil environment. You could take literally the exact same platform and apply it to gas and oil, water, wastewater, uh, most things that use remote telemetry. It does communicate Modbus uh, RTU so you can collect the telemetry data in real time without doing any other conversion. Uh, most PLCs in the industry use Modbus RTU so it would fit very nicely. It has a built-in analog and digital I.O. and again a signal indicator. Uh, the device supports most 0 to 5, 0 to 10, 0 to 20 milliamp and frequency type inputs so it doesn't matter what type of sensor you have um, it could interface into this box and, and convert it in real time uh, back to a remote location for monitoring and control. The router, um, the, the router is something that we introduced uh, last year. Um, it is a very robust product, very secure and very uh, intelligent. Um, it does many, many things. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that it does well is the ability to um, convert protocols from the outside world like Modbus back to, back to the um, a cellular piece of it uh, via an IP address. It has redundant SIM cards. Uh, you have the ability to do things like if, if you were using one carrier and it failed, it would automatically fail over to the next one uh, for seamless connectivity. It also will send you SMS messages if uh, something happened to the router or if it couldn't make contact uh, uh, with a piece of equipment. So uh, some of the basic uh, features that we have built into the product, it does use Gobi technology, with, which allows one box to support all four of the major carriers with the United States and North America, which includes AT&T, Sprint, Verizon, and T-Mobile. Uh, you don't need separate products to do this. There's a pull-down menu for, for each one of these things. It's a very simple setup. We have a watchdog hardware, uh, 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 a hardware watchdog, excuse me, that allows the device to reset itself because some of these locations in the remote desert, it's very expensive to go out and uh, maintain some of these devices. Um, so this device will automatically reset itself if it cannot make contact with the carrier or if it feels that the, that the hardware itself is not operating correctly. Does it have a robust industrial spec? Uh, the power supply is very wide. It supports uh, an Ethernet port and a USB port natively in the box and is expandable uh, with RS-232, 422, 45 uh, type devices. 
Um, and it's fast, depending on um, your carrier. You can do downloads of 21 megabytes and up uh, uploads of 5.7. Although the telemetry side of this thing uses very, very, very little data. The the uh, if you chose to put a live video feed on there, that's where the data starts to be uh, a little expensive. So the network security that we have attached to it, amongst other things, the device supports OpenVPN, which allows you to do a secure uh, VPN, which is a, vir a virtual private network, and it will tunnel from device to application and is very secure. So it goes from the router to a VPN tunnel to the carrier through the internet back to a VPN tunnel to your application. It's uh, OpenVPN or VPN is a very secure path. So some of the lessons that we learned. Um, one of the things that we learned is that there's no single technology uh, that is best for uh, every solution. So uh, although this one's great for many types of solutions, uh, we're not saying it's the only one. So the other thing is don't be, uh, don't be afraid to integrate some of the old with the new. Um, we took uh, some of the old sensors that we had and integrated it with some very, very neat technology to do some of the profiling with this. And we found out that our system was a, a, a really good candidate. We also found out what was causing some of the problems that we had. Um, you, your technology can include uh, anything from solar to sensors to cellular. You can, it's a wide spectrum of things that you could do, so don't be scared to, to uh, be creative on how you monitor your system. One of the key points here is that you have to understand your environment. Understand that when you deploy something, it has to work in the extremes. Um, I've seen equipment with sand in it. I've seen equipment with uh, water in it. I've seen corrosion. I've seen a lot of failures out in the field. It's because they didn't quite understand what their environment was, uh, how, how the environment was going to affect their product. Um, as edge devices start to expand, the uh, rugged and reliable is going to take place. You need to have a rugged and reliable uh, product. As the edge uh, networks become more complex, do the research on what the best practices are. Leverage your knowledge and resources. Um, in a perfect world, uh, you know, we, we made some, some uh, inferences here in reference to solar. In a perfect world, the, uh, uh, we, would, we would place the system on a solar panel and we would disconnect it from the power grid. But because solar is not quite as efficient and those pumps draw an enormous amount of current, in this case it wasn't, it wasn't very uh, uh, reliable. And that remote, remote management devices are, are critical. You have to have the ability to make sure that you, when you design a system, design it as if it was on Mars because um, you don't want to send uh, 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 people out to maintain these devices if you can avoid it. All right, well, that was very good, Bill. Um, a few questions for you. What was the main challenge that B&B Electronics faced during this particular proce project, especially maybe during the design process of the system? Well, one of the biggest challenges was really understanding uh, what our failures were. Um, so the, in, in this particular case, we couldn't understand, or I couldn't understand, why, the, um, uh, wh why we were uh, pulling so many pumps out of the ground. So this allowed us to do uh, a, uh, an analysis on what was going on. The challenges were obviously, the, the biggest ones were the, the environment. What is the prominent security issues associated with this sort of monitoring system? Well, the, the security is always in the background of people. Um, that's why we, we always recommend that you use a standards-based security. So uh, it's an obvious one. You don't want people, especially if this device was controlling, uh, a product you do not want uh, the ability to get hacked into. And can you maybe explain why doing something like this is important? What is the importance of having this type of system and what are the advantages for those who decide to use such a system versus those who decide to go with something else? Well, in, in this particular case, um, uh, water means everything. I mean, it's, it's the lifeblood of, of what we're trying to uh, produce here, which is enough water for people to use. What we were trying to do was make sure that we um, uh, had the ability not only to uh, 
get an idea of what the system was doing, but as well as making sure that if it failed, we knew about it. And you answered my final question with some of the main lessons that you learned already within your presentation. Is there anything else that you would like to add to those final lessons or maybe cover something that we didn't discuss during your presentation or um, something that you think that our viewers would find important to know about such a system or about BNB Electronics in particular? Well, BNB Electronics has been around uh, for a uh, over 30 years now. They started back in the 80s as a uh, serial connectivity and we've grown tremendously. We are now known as the world leader in um, connectivity devices and we're constantly expanding. Uh, one of the lessons that you should that, uh, cut, that uh, people should take away from this is that typically they don't pay attention to a system until after it fails and then that's where it becomes important. Plan for failures is what you should plan for. Thank you, Bill, for joining us. Well, that concludes this episode. I'm Megan Zimba, and I'll see you next time in the hot seat.